In the summer of 1978, I interviewed a man who worked as an informer for the FBI during the 1960s. His name is Dothard Perry, also known as Ed Riggs, also known as Bill Perry, also known as Othello. How were you paid? The pay was always in cash. Cash, and you would sign a card. It would go like this. A rendezvous or a drop-off point would be picked out either by yourself or the agent. You would meet the agent there. And usually it would be in a vehicle. You get in the vehicle, he would hand you the money. He would tell you first to count the money. He would tell you the amount while you counted it. If the amount was there, he would then bring out a card. On that card would be for the week of such and such. And in other words, the week was dated. So-and-so has been paid the amount of. Then you would sign the card, and then the agent would sign the card. The reason for this is that if uh, all of a sudden the IRS became very interested about where you were getting all this extra money from, you could always tell them to go back to the Bureau, and the Bureau would have your cards on file. I see. Uh, were there such things as bonuses? Oh, yes. What were they paid for? Bonuses were paid for, um, suppose, while you were meeting with, um, or you were at a meeting with Bobby Seals, uh, Chulai of the Red Army happened to come to the meeting, too, which is something which would be a new development. That's, that's bonus time. In other words, a hot piece of information. Hot piece, very hot piece. Did you ever suffer pangs of conscience? Quite a few times. Quite a few times. I still suffer pangs of conscience. Uh, I suffer from the fact that a lot of people trusted me, and I misused that trust. I suffer from the fact that uh, a lot of information that I gave out was the undoing of certain groups or certain people. Uh, I suffer from the fact that uh, I'm on the run constantly. Uh, I have no real life to speak of. Uh, you have no family life, really? You have uh, a wife? Uh, no, I don't have a wife. I do have a child. Uh, I can't see her uh, that often. I have to stay away from them because once I come around, uh, the Bureau shows up and harassment starts. Uh, I have very few close personal friends, no one to really confide in. Uh, it's, uh, it's like being uh, on the outside of a glass jar and everything is happening inside the jar, but you're on the outside. You can see it happening, but you can't participate. Why have you decided to talk to me? Uh, for the simple reason, I think this information should be, should, should, should be getting out, should be gotten, should be put out to the public. I think not only black people, but everyone should become aware of what your so-called law enforcement agencies do to so-called enforce the law. Uh, because between you, myself, and the audience, uh, I've seen more felons in law enforcement than I have in prison. Many would say, well, look, you yourself just got through saying that the DLA was involved in criminal activity. What's wrong with wanting to put them in prison? How would you answer them? I would answer them in this way. Um, first off, we have to understand why they did what they did. But I'm not even going to go off into that psychological hoo-ha. What I'm going to say is when you become just as bad as the people that you go after, then uh, <laughs> there's nothing gained and a whole lot lost. You also were active in the infiltration of uh, many cultural groups. Before we go into that step by step, how much research and study did the FBI engage in of black culture in the late 60s? A great amount. 
Give me an idea. Uh, from the thing is, I, I, I can, uh, they have a file on every type of magazine uh, that blacks read. They have a file on, on, on the music. Music? Uh, music, dance, theater, uh, actors, comedians, you name it, man. And they would actually study these oh, different... Yes. Oh, yes, definitely. What would they do with music? Uh, to understand the people, you have to understand the culture. To infiltrate, you have to understand. You had a lot of so-called white liberals that were infiltrating the so-called uh, black groups using the uh, information that they had gathered from the studies of blacks. Um, you mean just to understand the behavior pattern of our people? Oh, yeah. I can, uh, you know, Will Heaton could name out some jams of Miles Davis that I hadn't even heard of. He could name off some, some books that I hadn't even read pertaining to black culture. Do you ever see agents actually studying oh, the yes. music of... Yes, yes. Yes, I, 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 I have seen them going over uh, even video portion of cultural events. Uh, the understanding, like when, okay, you have an organization like uh, uh, Leroy Jones Black House. You remember that. Okay, Leroy Jones's place, which was done on the uh, thing of tribalism. I, I, that's where I first heard the word kintu, mantu, hantu, hentu. These, these words uh, of the African continuum. I, you know, I, I learned that from an agent. He ran it down to me. They make in-depth in studies of the personalities of the people they're dealing with, too, uh, uh, culturally. It always helps. When you, when, uh, it's the thing of you can take their culture and use it against them. How large would you say an extensive a collection on our culture would you say the FBI has? Would you... Rated as large as a particular library, like the Schomburg Library in Harlem, or I would rate it better. I would rate it better, and the, and the fact is that they go into details, details that we probably probably would overlook. Uh, Will Heaton used to meet me in in different places, you Who? know. Will Heaton, that was one of my super uh, supervising agents. Uh, there is a certain bar in the Los Angeles area where people into black cultural things met. And Will Heaton used to meet me there. And he would go into very long and tiring conversations with some very articulate brothers about culture, African culture, and Afro-American culture. Tell me about some of the uh, cultural organizations that you infiltrated and what you did. PASLA, Mafunde, uh, Watts Writers Workshop, which they had. The me Watts at. Writers Workshop? Yes. Uh, Watts Writers Workshop, which was one of the oldest established black uh, writers' workshop. That Turn place was burned down. Yeah. Uh, the bureau had it burned down. How do you know that? I, uh, I know because I participated. I did the arson. You burned down the Watts Writers' Workshop? Yes. Why did they want it to go? Uh, at the time, funding had been cut to the workshop, had been cut out, but it looked like there was a possibility of a grant being given back to the workshop. And if there was no theater, there would be no grant. How did you do it? Uh, two cans of kerosene, uh, a Purex bottle, gasoline, and a um, flare, highway flare. Why didn't you use more sophisticated stuff? Oh, no. No, 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 no. no, 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 no. You, 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 you're never overly sophisticated. It's too obvious. Uh, this way you make it look like... Uh, you know, maybe somebody in the neighborhood that got kicked out of theater at one time got mad and came and burned the damn theater up, that kind of thing. But you were involved in this theater? I mean, didn't it get to you at all what you were... Hey, man, that got to me a great deal. I love that theater. I built the stage.
You built the stage. Oh, yeah. Uh, when I got to the workshop, uh, the stage that had been, the original stage that had been built needed an extension on it. The original part of the stage was in terrible condition. They had no lighting system. I put the lighting system in myself. I put the stage in myself. And that was a stage, man. And that, that was a theater. It's a nice theater. Who was the director of that workshop? Harry Dolan. Harry Dolan. Some very, very uh, well-known artists supported that workshop, gave some money very, to it. Some very well-known artists came out of the Watts Writers Workshop. You know, uh, Glenn uh, Tubman, uh, uh, Yapit Koto, uh, Sidney Poirier used to come down there and give a class. Sammy Davis Jr. used to come down there all the time. Uh, Quincy Jones used to come there and give music classes. We had our own eight-track studio set up for uh, um, sound. We had our own sound room there. Was part of your other activities and responsibilities to uh, study the profiles of celebrities who were supportive of uh, organizations? Definitely, and especially, like I said, the psychological backgrounds, weaknesses and strengths. Did he have a weakness for blondes? Did he have a weakness for money? Did he snort cocaine? Uh, did he smoke marijuana? Uh, uh, they even get into, oh, and that was one thing the Bureau loves is their sexual background. Uh, they have files and files on different blacks, not only celebrities, but a lot of others, uh, sexual activity. What would they do with this information? Oh, that's used as a weakness. So they would feed these to these weaknesses? Yes. Did you see that happen? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, Doc Holliday, uh, who uh, is the, one of the leaders of the BGF, Black Gorilla Family, which is a prison gang, and the uh, California state prison system. Upon his release from prison, uh, a certain sister uh, made herself known to him at a nightclub, whereupon uh, he moved in with her, and she picked up names, telephone numbers, information, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, that lasted for a good three and a half months. Was this an unusual thing, or did this oh, no. happen often? No, that, that happens all the time. Did you yourself get involved in doing that? Yes. Give me an example. Uh, there was a gentleman that was on trial in Los Angeles that belonged to the BLA that had been busted in a southern state for a bank robbery, but was brought with two other people to Los Angeles to stand trial for the machine gunning of a police officer in Los Angeles. I was supposed to warm my way into the infections of his sister and uh, whatever it took to get the information that I needed as far as what kind of defense they planned to use as, as to turn this information over to the federal prosecution. Did you do it? Uh, I got the information and thank God I didn't have to go through with uh, uh, the actual thing of sexual activity. What do you mean thank God? Uh, the sister was rather unappealing. How did you justify to the organizations in which you had infiltrated yourself that you were living on an $800 a week stipend or on an $800 a week standard of living when most of them were living hand to mouth. Well, hey, brother, you know, uh, I'm hustling, you know. I mean, hey, man, <laughs> you know, so a little of this on the side, a little of that on the side, you know, I get over, you know, that kind of thing. In other words, ain't nobody's business but mine where I get the money. So, uh, you know, everybody took it for granted that I was possibly doing a little dealing on the side, that kind of thing. Hmm. Then also, uh, uh, everybody liked me for the simple reason that I would do things that I didn't have to do. I would go out of my way. You know, like Mafundi would have a pageant and they needed someone to do the sound setup for him. And I'd say, of course, I'll do it for you. You know, that kind of thing. 
uh, I was very well liked at one time in the community. Would you say to American citizens that this situation of surveillance and infiltration continues to this day? Oh, yes. On the dimension that you experienced? Probably much larger by now. Larger? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me put it to you like this. Each year, everything gradually escalated up more and more. So I figured uh, when I left, it, it didn't stop escalating. As they say, one monkey does not stop anybody's show. You mentioned Sammy Davis Jr., who at one time, uh, it was reported, gave money uh, to the Black Panther Party, I believe. Uh, were you ever assigned to look into that? Yes, I was, uh, I was told to uh, try to get as close to Mr. Davis or to anyone in his office as I could. I used to go up and have real chit-chat, chummy-chummy conversation with his personal secretary, Ann, at the 9000 building on Sunset. And I used to bring a Porter Pack video camera, and I used to go around and I would videotape the whole office. You mean celebrities would be coming into his office and you'd film them freely? Oh, yeah. Didn't they question that? I'm from the Ross Writers Workshop. Yeah, right on, brother. You know, that kind of thing. No questions asked. Same thing with the NAACP Image Awards, you know. Uh, they were very interested in people like Sammy Davis Jr. Uh, um, there was a, uh, another black uh, in Los Angeles that they were very interested in because, uh, not Los Angeles, but in Sacramento, Nathaniel Colley, who's attorney for the NAACP. And I know Nat. And uh, they wanted information on him, just for the simple reason that he's an attorney for the NAACP, which makes no sense to me, but may, must make a lot of sense to them because they use the information. You've been called upon to testify in Washington. Before who? Uh, before the Senate committee. I was called first to testify before the church committee. Uh, and I did go to Washington, D.C. I did testify to those people. And I want to say right now that uh, the committee was full of smack. They got loads and loads of information and didn't even use it, didn't release it. Um, they, I had tapes that I offered to them in evidence against the Federal Bureau of Investigation with conversations of me and my supervising officer uh, where he's telling me to obtain certain articles for him by stealing. Don't get fingerprints on it. We can really use that. Uh, did you take the weapons over to such and such? Uh, the church's committee told me that um, they couldn't use the tapes because uh, the tapes were gotten by illegal means. What would you say about the composition of the committee panel that questioned you? Uh, I can say that's for the birds, too, because the same people that I was talking about were the same people on the, on, on, on the panel with the church's committee. What do you mean? When I came in the room to be interviewed by the so-called people from the church's committee, uh, the representatives from the Federal Bureau of Investigations were also in the room. FBI agents were a member of the church committee panel? Uh, they were there with the investigators for the church's committee asking questions just like the church's committee. And see, this is another thing that I, I find fault with, and this is another reason why I am not going to Washington, D.C., is that, again, I have been asked to come again for the second time. I am not going again for the simple reason that when I went up there, I went up there with the idea that there were agencies investigating the Federal Bureau of Investigation, not the Federal Bureau of Investigation investigating itself. You're on the lam almost. Um, do you have a sense that you're going to be arrested and go to prison? Oh, yeah, eventually. Eventually, when things come to a head, it has to. It has to be that way. No other way around it. What would you say to citizens who sit and listen to what you've said and have a sense of frustration and helplessness? There are some agents, the old line agents, that disagree with the tactics that were used during the so-called COINTEL period. 
But one thing I don't want us to jump off of is that people always talk about, they're talking about COINTEL now so heavily. Uh, I'm not talking about COINTEL, I'm talking about a thing called BD, which was better known as Black Desk. The Black Desk was set up for a simple thing of infiltrating black organizations and black groups, whatever. Where was this black desk, or were there a number of them? There were a number of black desks, but the head black desk was in Washington, D.C., controlled by Sullivan. And the... Was he black? No. Mm hmm And what was the function of the black desks all over the country? I guess there were dozens. Uh, to, the function of the black desk was to monitor activity, social unrest, revolutionary groups, cultural groups, and such, in the black community. And feed it into the central yes. desk. And it still exists? As far as I know, yes. We've seen a number of investigations into the assassination of uh, Martin Luther King. We've seen an extended police trial of the assassination of Malcolm X. What you seem to say substantiates what many black people say out on the street that government agents or agencies knew that these assassinations were brewing and either participated in them or allowed them to take place. It would behoove black people, it would behoove all people, really, to question uh, so-called the cut and dry uh, <laughs> one lone assassin theory. Uh, the Bureau and other intelligence agencies are very good at conspiracies. They are very good at setting people up to be killed. They are very good at making innuendos so the person will be killed. City police don't know about because they have policemen in there. They don't let black people form anything without some policemen in there. And while I was in the black Muslim movement, over the black Muslim movement, many of the police who were sent to infiltrate us, they're black, would tell me, say, look, I'm a cop, but I have to come. They would tell me. I knew the, 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 the Muslim movement was full of police. So don't you think anything is going down that they don't know about? The only thing that goes down is what they want to go down. And what they don't want to go down, they don't let it go down.